things that you'd ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners, the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from nine to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews, and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wotton tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, mate. Send me to the studio, Hello. please. How are you keeping? Busy? I've got a brand new show coming on GB News called The Friday Night Feast. Oh, yeah? I'm going to take a new news angle on the week's biggest stories. Move it forward. I want to talk about what I think we should be talking about, not what we're being told that we have to. Right, well, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it. A brand new show right here on GB News. The Friday Night Feast, 7 p.m. until 9 p.m. with me, Patrick Christie's. What could possibly go wrong, guys? Oh, I've left my wallet in a cab. Welcome along, uh, GB News, live on your telly and on your wireless. Tonight, all the fun stuff, the collapse of the union, the collapse of democracy, and we'll round things out with the collapse of everything. We really could use some breaking news about a new royal baby to lighten the diet, but he'd only grow up to be Prince Harry or Prince uh, Andrew. So what's the point? The saving grace of the show is, as always, your comments and questions. So do send them along by email to gbviews at gbnews.uk or via Twitter at gbnews. All that, of course, after the news with Polly Middlehurst. Good evening. You're watching Polly Middlehurst in the GB newsroom. Our top story tonight. A rare red weather warning has been issued for South Wales and the southwest of England ahead of Storm Eunice, which is due to hit the UK tonight. Well, let's just show you some pictures of those weather conditions. All schools in North Wales and Bristol will close tomorrow as a precaution. Damage to homes, further travel disruption and power cuts are expected and some schools in England are also considering closing tomorrow. In other news, Boris Johnson says an attack on a kindergarten in Ukraine was a false flag operation, a reason for Russia to fabricate a reason for an invasion. Speaking on a visit to RAF Waddington in Lincolnshire today, the Prime Minister said he feared this is the kind of thing we are likely to see more of over the next few days. We know it was a false flag operation uh, designed to, uh, uh, to discredit the Ukrainians, uh, designed to create a, a pretext, a, 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 a spurious provocation uh, for Russian action. Boris Johnson. Well, the Health Secretary says an announcement into a government review of COVID protections will be made next week. During a visit to the UK Health Security Agency in Porton Down, Sajid Javid said future plans will focus on protecting those who are clinically vulnerable. It comes amid reports that free COVID testing is set to be scrapped. We are looking at you know, how we learn to live with COVID, and that does mean the protections we've enjoyed over the last few months, that they all should be reviewed. So we're looking at the very latest data, and next week we'll have more to say about it. 
Sajid Javid. The Home Secretary has stopped the preferential golden visa option for wealthy foreign investors seeking residency in the UK amid security concerns. The closure of the Tier 1 investor visa route affects all new applicants from all nationalities with immediate effect. Priti Patel says the move will help stop corrupt elites threatening national security. Now, as we heard earlier on, the UK is bracing itself tonight for the impact of Storm Eunice. Our home and security editor, Mark White, has more. Storm Dudley has already barreled across the country, the smaller of two storms battering Britain in as many days. But Dudley still left very significant damage. Trees down, roofs lifted off, major disruption to travel. In the hours ahead, it's the turn of Storm Eunice, a much more powerful weather event with red warnings of 100 mile an hour winds, tidal surges and snow for some. For Storm Eunice, continuing coverage, stay with GB News. Mark White, on TV, online and on your radio via DAB+, you're watching GB News. Now let's get more from Mark Stein. Exactly two years ago, the Italian cabinet met to discuss a dramatic public policy decision. The possible quarantining of 10 northern municipalities. Well, the 10 towns turned into the quarantining of half the country, and that idea spread faster than the COVID. But don't worry, just two weeks to flatten the curve. Two weeks to flatten the curve turned into two years to flatten everything but the virus and then vaccine passports if you want to keep your job in the NHS or at a New York hospital. Or get a cup of coffee in France or buy food to keep yourself alive in Germany or not get fined and jailed in Austria. But don't worry, it's just a couple of jabs. Well, OK, three. Well, OK, once every five months, according to America's Centers of Disease Control. Well, let's make that every three months, according to President Macron. Oh, and in Britain, we're going to stick it in your kids, even though there is no medical justification for doing so. Oh, and it's such a public health emergency, we're going to treat it like MI6 black ops and withhold all the info. From the Evening Times in Glasgow, quote, Public Health Scotland will stop publishing data on COVID deaths and hospitalizations by vaccination status over concerns it is misrepresented by anti-vax campaigners. The public health watchdog announced the change in policy in its most recent COVID statistical report, saying the frequency and content of the data would be reviewed. Instead, officials will focus on publishing more robust and complex vaccine effectiveness data. Uh, public Health Scotland officials said significant concerns about the data being misused deliberately by anti-vaccination campaigners is behind the move. So the report published on Wednesday will be the last weekly publication to include the data on infection rates among the vaccinated and unvaccinated. By COVID data being misrepresented, they mean uh, noticing that, say, in the four weeks ending February the 4th, 478 Scots died of the COVID, of whom 417 let me see, that's over 87% were vaccinated. So over 80% of Scottish deaths in the last four weeks have been among the vaccinated. Yeah, I see how releasing those numbers could easily be, quote, misrepresented. Best that the government keeps the numbers to itself. And in case you were feeling not entirely 100% on board with all of this and were minded to protest, the New Zealand military are being readied to clear protesters outside Parliament House in Wellington. The non-stop 24-7 Barry Manilow uh, 
uh, soundtrack that Jacinda Ardern was pumping out to drive the protesters nuts didn't do the trick. It turns out there's a big correlation between anti-vaxxers and Barry Manilow fans. Who knew? So Jacinda is going old school and sicking the troops on them. But even if you don't want to protest yourself, but just want to say send 50 bucks to some Canadian trucker who wants to keep his job, Justin Trudeau, the world's first totalitarian mammy singer, will freeze your bank account. Here's Canada's laughably misnamed Minister of Justice. You've just compared people who may have donated to this to the, the same people who are funding maybe a terrorist. I just want to be clear here, sir. This is really important. A lot of folks says, look, I just don't like your vaccine mandates and I donated to this. Now it's illegal. Should I be worried that the bank can freeze my account? What's your answer to that? Well, if, I think if you if you are a member uh, of you know a, a pro-Trump movement who's donating hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars to this kind of thing, then you ought to be worried. Uh huh. So if you're favorably disposed toward the 45th president of the United States, the Canadian Minister of Justice wants to seize your current account. Oh. And if the totalitarian mammy singer catches you on the streets of his capital, he'll confiscate your kids and dogs. The free world seems to have traveled a long way from those first 10 municipal quarantines in northern Italy. What's really going on? You can email me, gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can Twitter me at gbnews. Joining me now is Maxime Bernier, former Canadian foreign minister and leader of the People's Party, Le Parti Populaire du Canada. Maxime, uh, something really bad is happening that is unprecedented in the Dominion of Canada's history going back to 1867. We have a, a, a state of emergency when there's no emergency, and that is a terrible affront to a democratic society. You're absolutely right, Mark. And I just want to read the Section 3 of that Emergency Act, very short. It said, a national emergency is an urgent and critical situation that seriously endangers the lives, health, and or safety of Canadians and is in, of such proportions as to exceed the capacity or authority of a province to deal with it. So let me tell you that seven provinces said to Justin Trudeau, they don't want that uh, emergency act. They don't need it. That's what they said. So you're right. There's no emergency. There's no insurrection. There's no civil war. And Justin Trudeau is using that act for the first time in the history of our country to crack down on his political opponents. Well, I, I had a look at uh, Christia Freeland's uh, most recent tweet. She's the uh, deputy prime minister. She's Justin Trudeau's deputy and uh, uh, for UK viewers, she was a deputy editor of the Financial Times in London during a particularly unreadable phase of its, uh, of, of its history. And she says the names of both individuals and entities, as well as crypto wallets, have been shared by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police with financial institutions and accounts have been frozen and more accounts will be frozen. So if you disagree with the government now, they're freezing your bank account. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, for no reason. And, uh, you know, what they're doing right now, they're, they're looking at these uh, truckers in Ottawa like if they're terrorists. They're not. They're Canadians that are saying enough is enough. We want you to follow the science. Please follow the science. There's no reason to impose draconian measures to impose a vaccine passport. And actually, provinces in Canada understand that. And in Quebec, in Alberta, in Saskatchewan, in Ontario, all these mandates will end in the middle of uh, before the end of this month. But Trudeau is still pushing and pushing and doubling down on the violation of our freedoms. 
What, what is actually going on here? Because we've had two years now of accelerating across the Western world, of accelerating dissent into unfree societies. Uh, in this, in, in the case, that, so we end up with the Canadian Minister of Justice boasting that if you are someone who appears to support the 45th president of the United States, that could also be a cause for seizing uh, your checking account, your current account. Um, yet Canadians seem to be putting up with this. And it's almost as if the last two years of lockdowns and all the rest have, have softened people up into thinking this is a normal way for a government to behave when it isn't in the least bit normal. I, I don't recognize my country anymore. You know, here in Canada right now, it is like, uh, you know, a Soviet level of a crackdown of, on political opponents. And that's what the Trudeau government is doing. And actually, he did the same thing during the last general campaign by dividing the population, good Canadians, bad Canadians. So Justin Trudeau, I believe, is doing like his father did in the 1970s when his father uh, invoked the uh, uh, War Measures Act at that time. Now it's, a, it's a, a new act, the Emergency Act, but there's no reason for that. And I can tell you that this weekend in Ottawa, the truckers are there and they will stay there. Trudeau can solve that by ending the mandate. But now he's crushing down on ordinary Canadians. And uh, we are not in a democracy anymore when you cannot protest. We are not in a democracy in Canada right now under that government. But I must tell you that uh, in the next uh, seven days, the parliament will have to vote on, an, uh, on a motion. And if that motion in line with the, the Emergencies Act, and if that motion does not pass, it will be the end. And I hope, I hope the parliament will stand up for our freedoms. And uh, it's so important in our Canadian history, the, the, the members of parliament must uh, stand and uh, proudly to Justin Trudeau, enough is enough. We don't need these uh, new powers to uh, resolve that crisis. Do you think that um, that uh, Monsieur Trudeau and Miss Arden in New Zealand and Monsieur Macron in Paris, that uh, they've had two years of extraordinary powers of being able to control every aspect of the, the citizen's life, including whether you can go uh, and have a cafe au lait in uh, Nice or Marseille. You know, absolutely every aspect of life. And, um, and it started out as being something to do with a virus. The virus has degraded to this Omicron thing that is no threat to anyone. And yet all the control remains. And they don't seem to want to give up the control. Um, is, is, is it, is it, uh, do, you, do you think they're serious about retaining these powers in perpetuity, as it were? I believe that they really enjoyed the, the, that power that they had during that COVID-19 hysteria the last uh, two years. Uh, but that's why. What, is, what Justin Trudeau is doing right now, this is a power grab. That's it, you know, a power grab. Justin Trudeau... Uh, loves, loves the fact that he's able to, and he said that before being prime minister. You know, he really like China, the communist China, because it's <laughs> easier for them to solve problems. They can impose that on, the, on, on their society. So he's doing like uh, being a, a Chinese communist right now in Canada. So, and, and I know that yeah. all these mandates will end, I hope soon, but my fear, is when we'll have another crisis, they will jump in and try to use these unconstitutional, illegal powers that they had during COVID-19. We must be very vigilant, mm -hmm. and you can count on us and on the People's Party of Canada to be there and to stand up and speak out for our freedoms. Yeah, you know when he said he admired the, the China's basic dictatorship, everybody thought, 
gave him the benefit of the doubt and thought he was uh, talking about their ability to solve, you know, environmentalist problems. So that if you're a dictator, you can ban plastic bags at supermarkets in three minutes. And isn't it great China has a system like that? We didn't realize that Justin Trudeau and a lot of other prime ministers uh, actually are adopting Chinese uh, views on freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of movement, freedom of association. These are all core Western liberties, uh, and uh, they predate the Canadian state by centuries, and, and uh, they've all, they're all being demolished before our eyes, and yet at least half the people seem content to go along with it. They use fear, they use censorship, and yes, they were very, very efficient uh, to scare the population. But we here in Canada right now, about maybe 45% of the population is saying enough is enough, and they want to get rid of this uh, mandate. But also, uh, I know that Trudeau has the support of, I believe, around 50% of the population for him to invoke the emergency act. So we need to educate the population. We need to tell them, you know, you cannot do that in a democracy. Actually, as you know, the bridge, the ambassador bridge, truckers were there and the police were able to dismantle that protest peacefully. And so without these extravagant powers that Trudeau just have right now under the emergencies act, why not? You know, you he, he, he doesn't need he doesn't need to use that act. So it's is showing to everybody that if you don't agree with Justin Trudeau and his philosophy, you're gonna pay for it, and that's what he's doing to Canadians right now. Yeah, and and that remark the justice minister made about uh, you know you better not be a Trump supporter. That's absolutely outrageous in a democracy. And I regret that in London, the Prime Minister did not call in the Canadian High Commissioner and haul him over the carpet for that, because I, I think a lot of other uh, nominally free societies around the world should be saying that we're not interested in going down the path that Canada's taken this last week. Thank you, as always, Maxime Bernier, and long may you flourish, uh, but be careful about giving a honk of support or the gendarmerie will club you to the ground like the Ottawa cops did to that four foot ten great grandpa. Takes a lot of guts to do that. You, you really need a crack team of policemen uh, to clobber a four foot ten guy to the ground. We will get your views next. GB Views at GBNews.uk. You can tweet me at GB News. Plus, Liz Truss is so committed to the inviolability of the Ukraine border, she jets off to Moscow to face down the Russian tough guys. But when it comes to the United Kingdom border, that's not such a big deal, is it? Kate Hoey is here to discuss that. Don't touch that dial. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News.
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews, and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Let's get straight to your comments uh, on whether <laughs> this is incredible, actually, if you gave 50 bucks, as many people in the United Kingdom and around the Commonwealth did and in the United States to these Canadian truckers, uh, they're now uh, putting you on a list and seeing whether uh, banks can freeze your accounts, uh, as I put it. <laughs> Uh, seize the bank accounts of Trump supporters. And a Twitter user says, by seize, you mean thieve. Yeah, there's a lot of straightforward thievery going on, as we heard on yesterday's show, when there was talk about giving the GoFundMe uh, money to more acceptable uh, causes such as Black Lives Matter and Antifa. And Faye says, isn't this a human rights issue we condemn regimes for? Yeah. You know, when you look at the, for example, if you just take the Commonwealth Conference, the kind of things they get, you know, they threaten with uh, kicking Pakistan, suspending Pakistan's membership or suspending Fiji's membership. You know, there's grounds for getting together and suspending uh, Canada's membership. I'd be interested to hear what the Commonwealth, maybe we'll ask the Commonwealth Secretary General to come on and ask whether Justin uh, Trudeau's dictatorial mammy singer routine uh, is compatible with Commonwealth membership. Uh, Stuart on Twitter, though, Stuart says, I don't object to protests, but you can't paralyze a place. Others who don't agree with you have a right to move about. Stealing people's money is not the way. Well, the only people stealing money are Her Majesty's uh, government in Canada. Uh, and I, I would say this, we have spent, since... Um, Late May, early June of 2020, we have seen on innumerable occasions in Britain and, and elsewhere, particularly in America, mobs rampaging around, destroying property, as these guys in Ottawa have not done. Uh, for example, pulling down uh, statues of that bloke in Bristol, pulling down statues of Queen Victoria uh, outside the Parliament at Manitoba. And uh, they, uh, they've got nothing for it. Nothing's been done about that. They, no one declared any emergency. In fact, uh, nobody prosecuted most of these crimes. They had the, exactly the same thing in Parliament Square in London, uh, where the vandalization of all kinds of statues, including Churchill and Abraham Lincoln, and nobody objected to that. That wasn't an emergency at all, just like this isn't an emergency. Keep your tweets and emails coming. Something is happening here. The last two years uh, have, uh, have been an exercise. They're basically pilot programs, whether they're talking about jailing you in uh, Austria uh, or uh, forbidding you from going to get food to keep yourself alive in Germany, from putting you in quarantine camps in Australia's Northern Territory to now uh, freezing your bank account and taking all your money in Canada. These are all like local pilot programs uh, for, for, for ideas that are going to spread. Because the whole idea, if you look at uh, establishment talk, net zero is part of this. Net zero can't possibly work unless you get the citizenry used to leading smaller, more shrunken lives. Uh, and that's really what the last two years has been a tremendous exercise in. And whether it's, and it doesn't really matter whether it's a supposedly uh, left-wing or right-wing government. You know, Ottawa is supposed to be left-wing. Uh, Jacinda Ardern is left-wing and Canberra and London are supposed to be right-wing and it all comes out awash. Anyway, remember those good old days when Boris Johnson used to talk about the awesome foursome, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland? Alas for the union, it seems that three's company, four's a crowd. The EU determined to exact a real price for Brexit and has severed a so-called United Kingdom in two. 
Uh, so Liz Truss gets all wound up about Putin annexing eastern Ukraine, but doesn't seem to have noticed that Brussels has annexed Northern Ireland. Uh, the EU uh, wanted to teach its members that secession comes at a price, and they consciously chose to weaponize the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, and it's working out pretty well for them and for Dublin and for Sinn Féin, to the point where it may well be that historians record that ultimately the answer to the Irish question was Michel Barnier. Who knew? Kate Hoey is back with us, and we're delighted to have her. Uh, as you know, Baroness Hoey was a longtime Labour Party bigwig of unusual inclinations, pro-Brexit, pro-Union, and she was very much the star turn at uh, a packed anti-protocol rally at Dromore in uh, County Down the other night. Uh, Kate, it's great to see you. What was the mood of unionist sentiment in uh, County Down at that meeting? Well, I think, as you know, I've said many times and many people in Northern Ireland have said it, people here feel very angry. They feel that they've been abandoned by their own government. They feel very much let down. Even those who voted to remain uh, did not expect uh, the fact that the country voted to leave to then end up with Northern Ireland being left out. And that's really what's happened. Northern Ireland has not got Brexit. We haven't left the European Union. And to all intents and purposes, for most of our trading relationships and business, we are part of the European Union single market and their rules. And we'll have to continue with those rules when Great Britain, uh, the rest of the United Kingdom, diverges more and more from EU rules, which was what, of course, uh, leaving the European Union was, was meant to do, to make sure that we could, as an independent country, uh, take our own decisions. And, you know, it is rather ironic that Liz Truss, who's now in charge of negotiating with Sefcovic, has been out in Ukraine you know, speaking quite rightly about their borders and protecting their borders. And yet our country has actually voluntarily um, divided up the United Kingdom. And, you know, what other part of, if, if this had been happening in any other part of the United Kingdom, you know, say, for example, that they decided that the whole of Sussex was going to be left within the European Union uh, uh, economic uh, single market, then I think um, we would have seen a huge outcry. And I think it's only beginning, really, over the last few months for people in Great Britain to understand this and for more and more people to realise that this is a slippery slope because the reality is that if um, we get more and more left behind, then that is what the European Union want to see and what the Irish government want to see. But, of course, that has effects, I think, for the situation in Scotland as well. So if we want to protect the union and keep the union of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, then really this protocol has to go and has to go very quickly. Now, now when you say it, it, it suits Dublin, uh, that's true, it does. But when this thing started after Britain voted to leave, uh, neither Dublin nor London had any plans for a so-called hard border in Ireland. That, it was basically Brussels that leaned on Dublin to, and, and it's a, supposedly they're the two sovereign states that border lies between. And yet it was Brussels that basically uh, told Dublin, no, you'll follow our lead on this. Now, you were part of a, a group that, uh, that filed a legal challenge suggesting that this is in breach of the Act of Union of 1801. And as I read the Act of Union, it, it absolutely is. It says uh, uh, the, the, that, that from the first day of January 1801, that, that His Majesty's subjects of Great Britain and Ireland shall be entitled to the same privileges and be on the same footing. Uh, and it, it's a, it would seem to be a slam dunk, as the Americans say. And yet, apparently, uh, Monsieur Barnier and uh, the European Union can, can rewrite the Act of Union of the United Kingdom, too. Yes, that's quite right, Mark. And we're, we're still waiting for the outcome of the appeal section of the uh, Northern Ireland High Court. That, that judgment came 
hopefully will come in the next week or two, it's going to end up in the Supreme Court. And I think that's going to be a really important constitutional uh, issue for the Supreme Court to decide, because we believe that the Act of Union has been broken. The government are trying to say, well, they've actually, one time they say, yes, it has been broken. And then the next time they say, well, no, it's we've, um, we've only implied that it's been broken and it's actually still, you know, it still doesn't affect the constitution. But I think you're quite right about the European Union. The European Union saw this very cleverly. I mean, there's no doubt about it. They, they knew what they were doing. They saw this as a very good way of um, punishing the United Kingdom for leaving. And then initially the Irish government were actually, and the Kenny, who was the Taoiseach when we first left, was very keen to have discussions and allowed his civil servants to talk to ours because there was always going to be this issue about how we make sure that the internal market of the European Union is protected. And of course, Northern Ireland uh, being in, in the United Kingdom, then you have the border. But uh, after he left, uh, no longer was the new Taoiseach decided that this was actually quite a good issue. It was another way of kind of beating mm -hmm. up the British uh, and working towards a, an economic united Ireland. And of course, as the common market originally started as an economic basis and then became more and more political, clearly the Irish government see the trade increasing between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and all of that making it easier, longer term. If you've got an economic united Ireland, then it just makes it that little bit easier, they think, to get a political United Ireland. Well, I mean, I'm afraid, yes, you know, they're wrong on that because there's a lot of people in Northern Ireland who are very loyal to Britain, who want to be British, who believe in the United Kingdom, and they're not going to um, th let this happen. So I think the government needs to recognise, really, that they, we've been very, very patient. Uh, the leaders of the uh, Democratic mm -hmm. Unionist Party, the biggest party in Northern Ireland, has actually given Liz Truss a lot more time than originally they they said they would to negotiate. But, you know, we're going to have this joint committee meeting on Monday between Sefcovich and Liz Truss and a whole paraphernalia of officials to take stock. And I think that we may see one or two little minor technical changes that the EU announced with great gusto that they're giving back to the United Kingdom that, you know, perhaps they're going to say absolutely medicines won't be stopped coming into Northern Ireland. And, but it will, it will be tinkering. And I just think, you know, it is absolutely yeah. shocking when you think about it that we have to go to hop in hop to the EU to get permission to trade between one part of our country and another. No other country would have put up with this. And it, it's just shocking. And I think everyone now is beginning to realise that it, it's, it's unsustainable. Yeah, and, and essentially it's made Northern Ireland uh, actually a part of the European Union and the rest of the kingdom uh, has the kind of status of an Indian princely state. If you want to make colony, any big decision, you have to colony. go and beseech the big guy. And, and, and I, I think that's just utterly... I, I, I'm worried that Liz Truss, as you say, she'll come. She'll come away saying, "Well, they've uh, the. Uh, it was a very productive meeting. They've given us an exemption on uh, trade in potato crisps." But she doesn't seem to be approaching it as the affront to sovereignty that yeah. it is. It's an insult to London, and London should be done with it. Absolutely, absolutely right. There's been far, far too much, and I think the media has been very much like this too they've always been interested just in the trading issues and and pictures of lorries you know and, and big, big, obviously people in northern ireland have suffered because when you try to buy something now from great britain very often you're told it can't be delivered to northern ireland because the business is not worth their their pro you know they have to pay extra they have to get certificates they have to mm. do all sorts of extra bureaucracy so they're just saying we're not going to send to northern ireland but the constitution issue the fact that, that Northern Ireland is now being separated out and will be more and more, that is a constitutional issue. And I think everyone who cares about the union should be taking this very, very seriously and getting in touch with their own yeah. members of parliament. I think there are some members of parliament, uh, many of them who voted for uh, the protocol with the withdrawal agreement, not really, uh, you know, if I might be a wee bit patronising, not really understanding mm. it. I think now there is no excuse for them and no excuse for the Prime Minister to do what he said he would do. 
he was going to sort it once we had left the European Union. He now has to make sure that Northern Ireland leaves properly. Otherwise, Brexit is not done. Are you concerned that the Prime Minister, uh, both psychologically and as a practical matter, is willing just to write off Northern Ireland? Well, I don't, I don't think he, he does want to write off Northern Ireland. I mean, I, I, I know the Prime Minister quite well and I worked with him at City Hall and I, I, think, I believe him when he says that he is a unionist. I just think that um, the, the pressure to get Brexit over the line and the hor- horrendous situation in Parliament where we had you know, all those people, and remember the crucial person in all of this, who really made this happen was Theresa May. I mean, she is absolutely responsible mm. because she was prepared to sign up to the backstop, which was of going to leave the whole of the United yep. Kingdom in the customs union and the single market. And that's what the European mm. Union really want. And that's what, of course, the Remainers, people like mm. Lord Heseltine and Andrew Adonis and all these people who are still behind the scenes, push, push, pushing, that they might try mm. and actually get us to go back in again. So the, the, the whole way that Northern Ireland was used it, it wasn't really, um, you know, about the union or being anti-Northern Ireland. It was actually, too, about mm. trying to get the whole of the United Kingdom to stay within the rules of the European Union. But I think Boris knows, I genuinely think he knows that this is unsustainable. The COVID issue didn't help. And now, of course, we've got Ukraine. But I hope that on Monday, if we don't see any real movement uh, from the European Union, that the Prime Minister finally recognises that he has to actually invoke Article 16, which we've got all the legal right to do, given the, the damage to mm. Northern Ireland, both economically and, and societally. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm concerned about Liz Truss's public statements. Uh, and I'm also, I'm also a little disturbed about, mm-hmm. um, you know, how, how this uh, judgment at the... Uh, uh, High Court in Belfast is likely to go because, as I said, it it seems a complete. It seems completely obvious that foreigners, uh, to use a quaint term, but that foreigners uh, on the continent have essentially rewritten the foundational document of the United Kingdom. Uh, from 1801, and I find it, I'm, I'm surprised that that oughtn't to be just a matter for, for Northern Ireland. That ought to have Scotland, Wales and England furious too. Yes, and it ought to have a lot of the very eminent ex-judges and legal experts in the House of Lords, you know, which I sit in interested but frankly, mm. many of them are, are so kind of um, tied into the European Union can do no wrong attitude that they, they haven't really given this yeah. the thought uh, that it needs. And that's why, you know, it will end up in the Supreme Court and it will be a hugely, hugely important constitutional case, which has ramifications for the whole of the United Kingdom. And people have to, and government has yeah. to wake up to that because at the moment it looks like they're just sleepwalking to getting rid of the union. Yep. Yep. And, and it, it does apply to everyone. And all that stuff we heard that if an independent Scotland wanted to join the EU, uh, they would have to apply, reapply, and that would take years. I mean, who's to say they just can't take that Irish sea border and redraw it along Hadrian's Wall uh, if the Scots Absolutely. decide to get that? I mean, we're, well, we're in very weird territory here. Yeah, I wouldn't trust the EU on anything, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely right. <laughs> That's our thought for the day, folks. Thank you, Kate Hoey. It's always great to see you, and uh, we're going to stay on this uh, this story. It's important. Okay, enough of uh, matters like the future of the of the union or the future of democracy. How about this one? Is the jig up for everything? That's next. Plus, stump the Stein. You can ask me anything. GB Views at gbnews.uk or on Twitter at GB News. We're back in a moment.
GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners, the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Bank of England says to brace for the biggest fall in living standards in 30 years and inflation over 7% in America. Wholesale annual inflation in January hit 9.7%. So by now it's already in double figures. But, you know, maybe something bigger is going on. The U.S. government just crashed through the $30 trillion federal debt milestone. It's basically piling on an extra $2 trillion uh, in debt every year and increasing. So America uh, has to pay back $30 trillion just to get back to having nothing in its pocket. No one in human history has ever done that before. And when you look into the eyes of cabinet ministers and senators and congressmen of both parties, you realize nobody in Washington has any plans to pay that back. China, meanwhile, is buying up the world from the Solomon Islands to Sri Lanka to Antigua uh, with the profits from being America's discount warehouse. America chose at the behest of the Chamber of Commerce to outsource its entire manufacturing to China 30 years ago. If you go through your home, uh, you'll find that all the cheap crap is made in China with perhaps a few boutique luxury products from elsewhere, English shirts, Italian shoes, German cars. Uh, but America doesn't seem to have a foot in either sector. So what's holding the joint up? And is something really bad going to happen? Are we in fact at a hinge moment in history? Uh, Peter Hitchens joins me. And Peter, uh, you've you've never had a, a, a reputation for being a member of the America file right in uh, the United Kingdom, but you are a, a uh, an objective observer of this. Is is America kaput? Is it in a tailspin, uh, or 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 can it maintain uh, its uh, its 1950 hegemony as we move forward? I think America is roughly where Britain was after the Boer War at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, particularly because of the catastrophic intervention which the, the United States made in Iraq, uh, which of course Britain supported, uh, which I think did it enormous harm diplomatically and politically in terms of reputation, and also of course enormous economic harm. These wars are incredibly expensive and the price for them goes on on being commanded. So I think that there is a, if you wanted to look for parallel, so the USA is roughly where Britain was, what, 120, 125 years ago. And that is to say, in trouble, but still top nation. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of ruin in a nation. A lot of other things need to go wrong before it's really felt. 
On the other hand, as, as the, the Trump uh, events have shown, enormous numbers of Americans who had lived for all their lives on the assumption that tomorrow would be better than today uh, have discovered that's no longer the case. And the, the, what would once have been called the American working class is, I think, uh, very much diminished both in power and in wealth. And they're feeling it. And so there is a big internal problem there for, for the country. And those people also feel that they've been left behind, left out. Uh, they're, they're just regarded as hillbillies by Washington, D.C., and they, they don't count. And this, of course, is why they voted for the idiot Trump. So I, I don't, there are a lot of things stored up in the way of trouble for America. But as for the current state of the world economy, I'm assured by all kinds of neo Keynesians, everything's all right. It doesn't look that way to me. I don't think you can spend and borrow at this level without stocking up uh, major bills to come. And I think, of course, I predicted during the COVID panic that the inflation rate would go up very sharply, and that is indeed happening. And that's not just the COVID panic. Of course, lots of other things going on as well, not least the borrowing. And as, as you rightly point out, governments don't care about inflation. In fact, they're quite welcome it because it shrinks their debt. And anybody who's in debt is probably quite pleased about it. It's the poor, silly people who've, who've been provident and have saved money who are in trouble now, and the people on fixed incomes. Yeah, I, I take your point about the Boer War, but um, Chairman Xi and uh, the rest of the Politburo look at America and they think we're actually a little further along than that. And I don't want to uh, make too close comparisons between the, the fall of Kabul and uh, Suez, say, but they, but, the, but they reckon, I think the Chinese reckon we're somewhere between the Boer War and sewers, and actually maybe a little closer uh, to sewers in terms of uh, geopolitical eclipse. Well, it is useless trying to find an exact parallel. I myself was very pleased to, to see the United States finally getting out of Afghanistan. The, the, the USA and indeed the, uh, the other Western countries should never have been in there in the first place. Uh, it was a grave mistake, and it's, I'm, I'm glad it's over, and it's one of those things that I think Joe Biden should be praised for. He got out after other presidents had said they would and didn't, so I, I don't regard that as a defeat. Certainly not, not, not all the Suez, which was just a piece of ridiculous hubris where two countries tried to act well beyond their power and wealth and were then left in a very embarrassing position when it turned out that they were neither strong nor rich enough to do what they tried to do and, uh, and that they'd lied to do it. So I, I don't think you can really make that comparison. I have no doubt the Chinese watch, but the Chinese are very patient. Just, 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 they have a very long history. They don't need to rush. As sooner or later, they will, they will get oh, no. in a position where they will be able to, I think, put enough pressure on Taiwan for Taiwan's leaders to realize that there's nothing for them to do but to make some kind of deal. But that hasn't come yet. Uh, but I think that obviously they, China realizes that certainly in its own area of, of the planet, uh, it is gaining very rapidly in strength and power. Look what they've done to Hong Kong. And what's happened to them for doing that, that to Hong Kong? Absolutely nothing at all. But just, just, let, just let me uh, pick up on that bit about China's view on this, because you, you, you correctly say Britain and France didn't really have the money. Once uh, America set itself against them at Suez, uh, Britain and France were neither rich nor powerful enough. America accounts for 40% of the planet's military spending, yet it couldn't beat uh, goat herds with fertilizer over 20 years. And that's the reason that China laughs at them, Russia laughs at them, and the Iranian mullahs laugh at them. That it, it, it no longer, if you define the super, a superpower as being able to get your will in the world, even in Latin America and the British West Indies now, they've all been signed up to China's Belt and Road Initiative. Oh, sure, but the Afghanistan, I think, what was the purpose of it? What was the actual aim of the American in, in, intervention in Afghanistan? As far as I could see, it was to bring third wave feminism to Afghanistan, which was never going to work out very yeah. well. In any case, it's not a country which takes kindly to being occupied. And who, who has the strength or the patience or the knowledge or the language ability to do so. That was a, an absolute given from the start. That would fail. No one's ever succeeded in occupying Afghanistan or turning it to their will. There's so many precedents. It's just amazing 
that any country with anything remotely resembling a, a, a foreign service or indeed an academy was able to make such a stupid mistake as to go in there in the first place. I don't think that counts. I think the problems that face the United States have much more to do with its, uh, its ridiculous response uh, to September the 11th in the first place, and a lot of which took the form of the, of the attack on Iraq, which was, I think, probably much nearer to an American Suez uh, than Afghanistan. Uh, do, do, you, do you not worry, though, that um, what happened in Kabul exemplified the, the uh, blundering stupidity of the superpower? I mean, a, a couple of weeks before it had to skedaddle out of there, it's flying the LGBTQ flag from the... American uh, from the American embassy. Uh, it, it's introducing, you know, take your child bride to work day in outlying Afghan villages that it's that that it's a that it's a superpower uh, that uh, appears to be an a particularly ignorant tourist whenever it ventures more than 10 miles offshore. Well, quite. But this is the problem. If you're a cynical imperialist nation, as China is, and as the USSR was before it collapsed, then you set out to conquer territories so you can control them. Uh, the problem with the United States is it says it won't do that. It's not an imperialist country. It's not going to control or take over or colonize any more parts of the world. But it will, especially since the, the, the Bush doctrine and that ridiculous speech which the Blair creature made in Chicago, it will intervene in other countries for idealistic reasons to tell them how to govern themselves. And this, of course, will seldom work, not least because it's so inconsistent. I mean, if the United States is really so concerned about dictatorships and torture and massacre and all the rest of it, why is it such a close partner with Egypt? A, a terrible despotism which has murdered its own people in the streets of Cairo and maintains the most appalling system of repression. But they say nothing about that. It's, it's, a, it's an absurdity of the current stance of the Western nations towards the rest of the world. A supposedly idealist. It has no consistency whatsoever. They pretend to be terribly concerned about tyranny and, and all the rest of it in Syria, which is no doubt a dreadful country run by the most appalling despot. But at the same time, they, they, they constantly make friends with the Saudi Arabian despotism. It, there isn't any, any consistency in this or any purpose. Straightforward imperialism of the, of the sort which has caused China to, to, to grab Tibet and hold on to it like grim death and to turn Xinjiang. A, Chinese Turkestan, mm. uh, where the Uyghurs live, into a, into, a, into a deeply subject province. That, I'm terribly sorry to say, if you've got the, if you've got the determination to pursue it, will probably work. Uh, but idealistic intervention in other people's countries very seldom does, not least because they don't share your ideals. And if the Taliban turned up uh, in, in Illinois and started telling people how they should live according to Taliban rules, you can imagine the sort of reception they'd get. Well, it's more or less the same. If the U.S. Army turns up in Afghanistan and starts telling them to live by the, the, the rules of Illinois, it won't work. Why would anybody bother anyway? It's, it's unbelievably crazy. If I, were, if I still thought that I could have any influence over it, I'd be deeply unhappy. But my whole life was transformed when I realized that the battle was completely lost, uh, I, I was, that, that I was only making myself unhappy by trying to do anything about it. So I just sit and laugh. And I have to tell you, it's a huge weight off my mind. OK, well, uh, well, we're glad it's weighed off your mind and we hope that will be uh, be the same for other people, too. Who knows? Uh, Dan Wooden has a thumping Thursday for you. Uh, the next two hours with Dan. Stay safe, stay free. Hello, I'm Aidan McGiven. The Met Office have issued a rare red warning for Storm Eunice as it arrives during Friday. Widespread disruption for southern parts of the UK in particular, with the risk of dangerous winds in places. The calm before the storm on Thursday evening, clearing skies, lighter winds for a time, but around midnight, rain sweeps north. The winds very quickly ramp up widespread gales for the